Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us um, in today's program. My name is Sung Kim. I'm a librarian in digitization and special collections department at Los Angeles Public Library. Today, we will uh, discuss the importance of documenting neighborhood history and stories and how local artists such as Mickey Peck are taking on this type of work through art. First, I want to introduce the department I work at the Los Angeles Public Library's Digitization and Special Collections Department strives to bring the history and unheard stories of Los Angeles to life by arranging, preserving, providing access to, stimulating appreciation for, and advancing knowledge of the rare and unique collections that support Los Angeles diverse communities. Community archiving has been an important aspect of our department's working philosophy. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, we had mobile memory lab events in various branch libraries where the public can come and digitize their materials specifically related to Los Angeles history. Also, we provided library patrons workshops that teach personal archiving and opportunities to visit DIY memory lab at the central library to digitize their personal archives using our equipment. Even though we had to put these services on hold during the pandemic, we are hoping to revive them soon when our, our library can offer full services. Our dedication to community archiving drove us to launch the Los Angeles COVID-19 Community Archive to which LA County residents can contribute photographs, artworks, journals, and um, that document their COVID-19 experiences. This project also inspired us to look close to local artists, community activists, and organizations who are documenting their neighborhoods and dynamic changes that are happening around them. As a part of this observation, we learned about Mickey Pack, who is doing exactly the work we consider to be very important in preserving our stories. Los Angeles-based artist Mickey Pack, also known as Nicholas, started her Koreatown project in 2018 by illustrating street signs, iconic buildings, and neighborhood stores in Koreatown. Mickey works with a range of media, including digital print, um, digital and print illustration, animation, painting, typography, and sculpture. While she thinks Los Angeles is the best city in the world, Koreatown in particular holds a special place in her heart and her art. Let's welcome Mickey. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so glad to be here. Thank you, Sung, for the introduction. I'm Mickey Peck. Uh, I'm the, the face and the illustrator behind uh, Koreatown Times uh, art project, mapping the different uh, parts of Koreatown the neighborhood. Um, and I just want to dive right in, um, kind of explain uh, the process and the thought behind it. So my inspiration uh, for this project that some of you might have read in uh, my first map, I considered <laughs> Koreatown, a uh, Korean Disneyland. Um, it reminded me a lot of my childhood growing up in uh, Korea in the 80s and 90s. Um, and there's a lot of references that Koreatown is kind of like a uh, snapshot of that time in Korea. But also, um, uh, I moved around a lot. And also, uh, because of that, um, Koreatown was kind of like a, like a home station uh, mm -hmm. for a lot of my moves. So even though I lived in different areas, um, we, uh, we, as a person and as uh, my family, we would visit Koreatown often. 
Um, so in, in this slide, um, on the left is my first map, um, the story side, uh, which I modeled after the LA Times newspaper. And if you look at the center um, image, it's a picture of a hotdog. And those who don't know what hotdog is, is uh, like a Korean hot pancake with like a nuts and syrup in the middle. It's like a street food, uh, childhood, um, childhood food. And it was really the only time outside of Korea um, that I was able to try this outside of home was in K-Town. And that was a picture of when I um, first moved to K-Town in 2013. And in between um, or during my lunch break, I went down the street to uh, which uh, Asti Market, which isn't there anymore. Um, but in front of the market, there was a little hotdog stand run by a uh, husband, wife, and I would just buy one because it was it was there and it was so great. Um, and then also, that was, so when I first moved to Cape Town, it was 2013, but my relationship with the neighborhood goes way back. So on the other side of the, the photo is um, the Rodeo Galleria in the background. And on that piece of paper is my, um, eyeglass uh, prescription from 1997. So one of the first memories I have of K-Town is that my family would make like a weekend or day trip from Las Vegas to Los Angeles. And we were looking for an optometrist to get our eyes checked and get like glasses every year. And the first year uh, that we did that was in 97. And even though all this time had passed and I had moved everywhere from Las Vegas to San Diego to other parts of um, LA County, we would always go back to the same optometrist in K-Town. And they had my records from 97 until like recently. So it feels like home away from home, like K-Town for me. So I really wanted to celebrate and kind of express my, my feelings towards the neighborhood. And that's what led me to this project and inspired uh, this uh, this map. Um, thank you. Yeah, I uh, enjoyed going to the Rodeo Galleria, um, which was uh, really, uh, uh, it was right in front of, um, uh, the childcare stu uh, station where my children attended um, in Koreatown. And I really enjoyed going there and I would park there and spend some time um, going into the stores while I'm waiting for the kids to be done at the childcare center. So, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, can you, uh, let me see. Can you please yeah. explain a little bit about the process that you uh, that went into the Koreatown map project? So this this art project actually was um, like in my mind for like five years before I started it in 2018, and I didn't know exactly how I wanted to go about it, and the, there it didn't seem like there was anything out there that I, I could really model after. And I would look up different maps of Koreatown and there just wasn't something that I really wanted to see or that I wanted to highlight. So before I knew what it was, I just documented everything, like the signs that I love or um, of businesses that I frequented a lot. I would just take a picture. And I picked um, this picture on the left particularly because um, that little kiosk underneath the, the sign um, has, uh, in my knowledge, has changed three times um, since 2013. <laughs> so first, it was a, a duck roast barbecue spot mm -hmm. that I unfortunately never got to try. So I was really sad. And then um, it changed hands and it became um, an, like a soft serve ice cream spot, which was really good. And I liked it. And then recently that one also closed down and now there's a um like american style barbecue spot which is um wow. which is also great it smells delicious whenever you drive by so it's 
so there's i mean there's a little bit of um sadness for the previous businesses that had to close down but um always excited for new places to pop up and and then and i knew that if i didn't document these things they like k-town can change in an instant so it was all about just like document document take pictures of everything and um i think a lot of artists can relate but we tend to be like a little bit of a hoarder <laughs> we collect little sentimental things and um different objects that like we find significance in, and some other people might think like that's just so silly but so in the middle picture is um before before uber before lyft um k-town uh, has and had um a korea taxi or k-town taxi service and um a lot of these um different older uh, workers would come by the restaurants while you're eating and just like put a few of these cards on your table while you're eating so if you ever needed like a safe ride home or just needed a, a quick ride you could call these numbers and a taxi service would come right to you um and i thought that was very unique to k-town and i started collecting them so that's just like a little bit of my <laughs> collection of uh, k-town taxi cards mm -hmm. and then on um, the far right is the Korea K-Town or Korean newspaper uh, dispensers that are so prevalent and iconic in K-Town. Um, and this goes back to my childhood memory where we would make family trips out to K-Town. Uh, one of the things that we always did um, was our parents would give us two quarters or three quarters to go grab the latest uh, Korean newspaper so they could catch up on all their Korean news. Um, so that has been something that's always been in my mind and in my memory and inspired um, making the cardboard recreation. Right, I I can't relate to all of the stories that you just shared. Um, like I think I've seen that little kiosk on the left uh, photo. Um, I think last time I saw it, it was a dumpling place where you could go and um, like take out dumplings. Um, or um, or maybe it's like another kiosk on, in that same street mall, but like I used to take my dog to that um, dog grooming place. That's where I take <laughs> and, my dog to get groomed too. Right, no. and, <laughs> and then I feel like um, I would see people um, who work in those businesses come out during their lunch break and then, um, you know, take a little break or smoke break or talking to their friends um, on their phone. And I remember those um, scenes really vividly. Um, like just looking at the photo uh, makes me think about that. And also I used a lot of taxi services from Koreatown, um, going to the airport. Um, and it, yeah, definitely it was before uh, Uber or Lyft uh, was prevalent, but yeah, I can relate. I would keep one of them on my refrigerator just in case I need like a really quick taxi service right away. And yeah, definitely. And then the newspaper dispenser is very, uh, very Korea town. Um, um, and also I wanted to mention about like how uh, you said uh, artists likes to uh, uh, hoard stuff. And I, I encourage that because sometimes when like a collection comes from artists, like it became um, all these materials become a very important resources for researchers in the future uh, time. So um, even though you feel like you're hoarding stuff, but it could be a very helpful um, uh, materials for uh, people who will be studying you in the future. That's yeah. really encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, should we move on to the next? Okay. Um, yeah, and I was wondering, um, now a, a neighborhood, Koreatown is your uh, muse for your artwork. I was wondering how um, you uh, developed relationships with local businesses, um, local residents, and how, um, how you maintain them. Yeah, so, First, it started out as a, from a very personal place, from my childhood and all my experiences. 
and translating that when I actually got to live in Koreatown. Um, but I also wanted to make this into a community project. And I saw that, um, that uh, need in the community. Um, and I just started naturally kind of starting from the businesses that I frequent. And if I was able to talk with the business owners or just kind of like the people around the area, um, that's how I got to know some of the, the places. And um, I also thought more strategically, um, Los Angeles is actually very well um, organized by different groups and neighborhood councils. So I went out to check out the Koreatown Neighborhood Council meeting and met a lot of people doing a lot of good work already. So kind of connected to people through there. Um, and also, of course, like the internet and Instagram and social media is um, so easy to use. And a lot of people responded through um, the internet and got connected through a lot of people. Um, and also, um, while I draw in digital media, I wanted people who may not have easy access to the internet to be able to enjoy this artwork and participate. Mm -hmm. So I, like I said, I was inspired by the newspaper, the Korean newspaper dispensers, and um, and I love working with cardboard. So I just got this idea to recreate a few of them. So I made four in total when I launched the first map, and I placed them in um, four lo locations. Um, and I think each one was very unique to where it was. So one was like a um, professional work co-working space. Uh, in the center of Cape Town called Ito Society. And one was in a local um, institution, um, pizza, pizza spot, Coney's Pizza, which unfortunately um, burned down in a fire at the beginning of uh, 2020. Mm -hmm. um, and also, consequently, <laughs> that cardboard uh, dispenser also got lost in the fire. Um, and then the Pio Pico Koreatown Library, which um, is so important for me when I first moved to K-Town um, and I was just working, I had forgotten how important the local library is for the community and to um, people to go to connect and catch up on a lot of things happening in the neighborhood. Um, but I was fortunate enough to um, be so close to K-Town library that I actually started using the library again to rent books and just um, connect with the community. So I placed one there in the children's book corner. And then the last one is that still coffee up on third. Um, this coffee shop is run by a husband and wife duo who's, um, they're also very uh, native to K-Town in Los Angeles. Um, and they've been supportive of local art. So it just made sense to connect with them and place uh, the last, the last dispenser there. Oh. Uh, yeah, um, I uh, I was really heartbroken to hear about Coney Pizzeria uh, uh, burnt down and then they closed. Um, yeah, and um, <laughs> it's um, it's uh, it's great that uh, you talked about the accessibility part of it. Like you created the same versions, more similar versions of things in both. Um, uh, tactable actual physical materials and then you have digital uh, version and I I appreciate that you thought about that and also um, it, yeah it's it's great that it's accessible in many different ways and also um, I forgot to mention so if you look at each uh, newspaper dispenser right underneath is like a, a slit that's open Mm -hmm. And that's open for people to write their stories that they want to contribute to this project on a piece of paper and just slide it in. And mm -hmm. um, not not currently because of the pand pandemic, but before I would make um, trips every few weeks to collect um, uh, paper stories that people submitted. So that was a oh, that was a very fun aspect. Um, and that all the stories that I was able to collect beforehand, they're going to be in the next uh, map so yeah i really wanted to marry the the digital and the physical world because not everybody has access um so that was kind of just like a fun aspect for me to do and 
to connect with the community on another level. That's great. Thank you so much, Miki. Um, should we talk about your current project uh, or your next project here, or should we wait until the, the Q&A section? Um, yeah, we could talk about it now. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I recently saw, I follow you on social media account. Um, uh, and I saw that you are very busy uh, doing a lot of projects with other uh, artists, local artists. Um, and um, and I wanted to ask you like what you are currently working on, um, things that are happening right now that are exciting or just you know past months or so. So I recently, um, this past Saturday um, was part of, or are, am part of a group art show and we opened on Saturday, it's called All American and it's a um, AAPI group show. Um, part of our, uh, the funds that we are um, raising will be donated to local uh, organizations helping with the current hate crime um, issue in the Asian American Pacific Islander community. Um, and the show is going on through June 15th. And you could check it out at uh, U Coat. Um, they're like an apparel slash art gallery in Fairfax. Um, and a lot of great uh, other Asian American artists have their artwork there. And uh, I submitted two uh, new works. Um, so it would be great if everybody could check it out. And um, while this past year um, and into this new year was really difficult, it was also a really great time to connect with other Asian American artists and to see kind of this movement of people wanting to really um, unite and to to help each other uh, has been really great. And um, one group that I got involved in through that is called um, the KAC which is Korean American Artists Collective. And it's a artist run group to really um, not only bring together Korean American artists to get to know each other and build a community, but to um, work together to serve uh, underrepresented and marginalized communities. So through that project, um, I first got to be involved as a participating artist in one of their fundraisers uh, for BLM. We raised 10K the first fundraiser. The second fundraiser we um, raised for uh, voter rights and we raised 9k and our current project is called Chong Project which is an art portfolio made by Korean women, a uh, Korean American women artists for Korean American women um, and we're in the fundraising phase so if people can check that out that'll be really great. Oh wonderful. Um, can I please then, sorry. mention Oh, okay. <laughs> and then one last thing. Um, I know people were expecting the, the Koreatown map project to um, come out sooner, but with everything that went on, it was delayed. But I wanted to make an announcement that <laughs> the next map is coming out at the end of June. So oh, wow. people could stay tuned. And um, there's still time to like donate stories. So if people have, um, stories they want to submit, um, please send them my way. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, I will definitely share my stories uh, to be possibly to be featured on your new map. Um, one thing I wanted to <laughs> add to your uh, current and uh, past project was the you were um, the one of the voice actors for the Netflix animation series City of Ghosts. And you were the um, Korean restaurant owner's daughter um, in the Korean Koreatown episode. And I took a picture because I was so um, impressed and proud. <laughs> so I wanted to add to your um, many list of um, projects that you worked on and you're working on. Thank you. It was actually <laughs> like um, kind of surreal for me because I heard about Elizabeth Ito's um, City of Ghosts project. Um, maybe like a year before. Um, and I thought like, wow, what a wonderful um, storyline. I can't wait to see it. I hope she does something in Koreatown. And I was just a fan. And um, 
few months later, I get like an email and I thought it was spam because I couldn't believe it. But um, one of her team members from Netflix reached out and wanted to talk to me about my knowledge and just kind of my aspects of Koreatown. And it just like, it just kind of like went on from there, um, got to meet Elizabeth and her team, which were, which, which had a lot of amazing women uh, leaders and artists. So I was so um, honored to get to know them. And um, yeah, and then one day she said, hey, do you want to be um, a character for the K-Town episode? And I said, sure. So that's how that came about. So it was kind of a very surreal experience for me. Yeah, um, I was really interested um, in how the Koreatown was portrayed in this episode because um, there's a lot of intersectionality of cultures, um, how Koreatown is not only um, for Korean Americans, but like the demographics have changed and there are a lot of non-Korean Americans living there. And I think it reflected that reality very well. Um, and it was very um, fun to watch, even with my children, it was a good, good episode to learn about Koreatown. Um, maybe from that point, I want to ask you um, about um, the the idea of Koreatown, your, um, ask your, how you envision the Korean Koreatown to be in near and far future, because I think communities are always changing because the people who are living in there change, change and um, the characteristics because of that change. So um, I'm wondering how you want or you envision Korea town to be in near and far future or what kind of changes you'd like to see? Yeah, definitely. Um, obviously, I wish like all the best for our neighborhood. Um, and I'm really encouraged actually, there's a lot of um, local organizations and people working towards um, helping not only just, um, just the outside part of Koreatown, but the inner relationships between people, whether they're low income um, income residents or unhoused neighbors or elders and um, senior residents or new immigrants. There's so many different organizations um, doing their part and um, the neighborhood council, they're really in tune and trying to, their best to um, help everybody enjoy the neighborhood. So my hope and what I see happening is um, a more inclusive and welcoming community um, that knows um, each other and um, definitely more green space. I think we're, uh, um, there's a lot of groups uh, planting trees, so that's a really good sign and more spaces where communities can come together. Um, and hopefully uh, more, um, how do you say? <laughs> or um, I'll just say that Koreatown, even though it's changing rapidly, I hope it stays as a staple for not only the Korean American community, but all the different immigrant and um, minority communities that are there that make it so unique. Um, I hope they they are honored and they uh, will be able to stay and make uh, for a more diverse neighborhood. Thank you. Um, I wanted to bring out this print version of <laughs> your Korea Town Times, and um, I see that there is a map on the back, and um, this is available on your website as a digital version. Um, with the Google Map links. And I really wanted to um, maybe um, ask you to reiterate the importance of linking your illustrative work to an actual um, map um, in terms of um, re for people to remember the locations and where all these signages um, are standing right now. Yeah, I think um, Koreatown is re really unique where it's such a small area, but it's condensed with so many, um, not only residents, but businesses. And um, as, as a child, before I drove, it was actually really confusing to navigate the streets in K-Town. But as I got older and um, I understood and looked at the map, it's, it's a grid system. So it's very simple. 
And um, those who are native to the area or are very familiar know how to like navigate like the crisscross like smaller side streets to like avoid traffic. Um, you know, K Town is not just like Vermont and Olympic and Western. You know, um, so I wanted to put it in perspective. Like there's so many rich different um, people and things happening in this small area, but it's it's all just right next to each other. And also, um, as I make these maps and uh, map out these areas, I'm also thinking for my parents and my siblings who are not um, that familiar with Los Angeles and they still find uh, Koreatown a little confusing. I want them to you know, be comfortable navigating uh, the area. So I also think about them <laughs> as I make the map. Right, yeah, it's important um, for even for archives to really um, have uh, the relationship between um, an archival item to a geographical uh, location um, so that it will help people to um, understand fully about the history. Um, yeah, it's really important for archival works too. And I, I personally really appreciate that you um, made that really apparent um, how important to do that detail work. Um, from this, uh, I found a really interesting passage that really spoke uh, loudly to me. And I'm gonna read it and uh, ask a question. Um, so the passage reads, from the family whose small business survived the 92 LA uprising, to the little girl who walks to school around the corner, to the out of towner who's visiting Koreatown for the first time, whoever they are, I hope that they would enjoy my illustrations, find comfort and humor in the shared stories and feel ins inspired to also share their memories about the space we spend together in and in the neighborhood. Um, the reason I really like this, uh, your story is that, um, I also felt kind of comforted by reading the stories of other people who, um, who, who grew up in Koreatown and also experienced Koreatown um, in different ways. Um, I felt like I was uh, understood. I belong to a certain community. And um, I see that it's not only Korean Americans, but there are a lot of um, people from different cultural heritage who shared stories with you. So I wanted to ask you how um, how you think about like local artists helping uh, people developing cultural ide identities that is not just exclusive to one cultural heritage uh, group, but more inclusive, um, a broader uh, population. Yeah, definitely. I think. Um artists, we, we tend to go in our heads, but it, in a good way. Um, we recognize certain things that um, really resonate in our hearts, and we translate that into a visual or um, some sort of communication form. And um, while we do that, um, another person or a different artist could interpret it differently or feel it um, a different way in the same art. Um, and I think that's important to continue doing because in one way we are helping people to see themselves um, represented and reflected in um, a public way, or in my case, like a printed, um, printed word. Um, and that's important, I think, for people to um, find strength in who they, who they are and to um, find, um, reassurance in the community that they belong to. Um, but also, um, you gain new perspective um, just by seeing um, something that you might have seen um, all the time, but interpreted in a different way or pre presented in a different way to kind of open um, your mind to other things. Um, and I think not only artists, but everybody's experience is important. Um, important to be uh, recognized, important to be heard. Um, so I think artists also have a responsibility 
um, to give their platform people who uh, may not have historically been heard or seen. Um, and in my case, um, even the most boring stories, I, I would love to put in the map because um, it, if it, if it's any story and it, it happened in Koreatown, I think it, it has um, significance to be recognized and to be read and to be printed somewhere. So um, I love hearing all the different kinds of stories, not like just the crazy or funny ones, but even the most mundane, everyday aspects. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I love how you interact with other local artists and um, I like you said, like how, um, like you interacting with them kind of um, inspire you to do different, um, see things differently and um, feel responsible for um, things that are happening in the society. So um, on that note, I, <laughs> I wanted to ask you whether, um, uh, whether you have a certain, um, how do I say it? Um, uh, a shout outs to other local artists who are uh, possibly doing similar works as yours. Um, and I, as again, I follow you on um, social media accounts and um, I see a lot of um, your local artist friends doing um, very important work. And if you could introduce a few of them to us um, through our <laughs> program, um, maybe people will look them up and then be inspired as well. Yeah, and I'm I'm not the first one to kind of like you know highlight and show love to K Town. Um, and one person um, I want to mention first is um, she's an artist photographer. Um, her name is Helen Kim. Um, her Instagram ha handle is the other Helen Kim. <laughs> And I think it's a play on, there's so many Helen Kims out there. But um, she uh, not only is a photographer, she's a storyteller and a graphic designer and personally like a, a mentor, a knee for me for as an artist. Um, and I just happened to um, connect with her through in Instagram and got to, to know her in real life over the years. Um, she actually started a project called K-Town is My Town. And she did... Um, a whole program of, of a walking tour, um, gathering strangers, just like putting it out there. And then she would walk and tell her her kind of childhood story growing up in K-Town because all the, the streets are still there. So she would go through the whole process and they would um, end with a nice dinner at um, one of the Korean restaurants. So um, I would really give her a follow. She's, she's really great, great photographer, great uh, storyteller. And um, somebody new that I met through Instagram, um, his name is Emmanuel Han, and he's a photographer from New York who recently moved to K-Town. And he's going around doing these really beautiful uh, in-depth interviews with uh, Koreatown um, small business owners and doing um, amazing intimate uh, portraits of them and in their business. Um, and yeah, it's been, it's been a treat to read his stories because I, I'm a little bit of an introvert sometimes, so I can't get like detailed um, stories on the businesses, but he does that, so that's really great. Um, and lastly, um, she's a artist, she's a curator, she's a community activist, and she lives and loves um, Koreatown. Her name is Jeannie Ha, and um, she just curated a, a group show called uh, On Becoming, that's going through June 12th, and it's about being seen and becoming free. And um, a lot of her work is community activist based, based but um, yeah, she's, she's, she has great love for K-Town, so I wanna recommend those three. Thank you. Yeah, um, uh, if you, uh, for the audience, if you wanna follow Mickey on Instagram, you will see uh, how Mickey interacts and promotes um, uh, all her artists and um, and activists friends on her account and um, I I am personally very grateful that I got to know all these um, activists and artists through Mickey and um, yeah you will I think you will also be grateful too um, 
I'm going to, uh, before we move on to the next section, I'm going to read some of the comments and questions from the audience. And um, Sugi Fu says, City of Ghosts, so cool, heart. And Isabella Gonzalez, so cool, congrats, Mickey Peck. And she has so many good memories in Koreatown. Um, Isabella used to live on Irolo near the Jones. I got my wedding dress at Ihua on Western. Yay! The Hanbok and wedding dress um, business on Western. That's uh, Ihua Hanbok. And um, YM Chi says, since you're from outside of LA, how has living in Koreatown impacted you personally and or professionally? Yeah, so um, before I, I was able to live in K-Town, it was really um, just like kind of surface level experience. Like they were still very important, but it was um, there was only so much I could um, absorb as like a weekend trip or just like a day trip. Um, but as I had the opportunity to live in Cape Town, I noticed like the slower, smaller uh, moments. Like um, I used to jog around the neighborhood and there was this corner with a fence uh, house and there was a white dog that was always there out sunbathing and just something intimate and even small like that was important and I would notice um, like particularly the street vendors on certain corners um, how they come out like when the sun goes down um, what kind of food they are selling um, so little things like that little changes um, I, w I learned to appreciate and really realize how diverse uh, the neighborhood the, the neighborhood is and um, also how not only these um, brick and mortar businesses but these smaller street vendors and different people that are um, in the microcosm of uh, Koreatown um, how they exist and how it's important for different levels of the community to um, to get around and just have access. So I learned to appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Helen Kim uh, asks, do you feel that engaging with Koreatown so intentionally through your art and activism in recent years has changed your understanding of Korean American or Asian American identity? Yes. Um, although I did know going into it, it could be very uh, complicated. Um, and different generation, different um, cross sections of socioeconomic levels can be very different. Um, and I was actually really afraid to <laughs> start this project. Um, but I, tr I try to focus more on um, what's in front of me and not like to get too deep into my head and um, it's actually been really rewarding as long as um, I keep a positive attitude and um, think for think on how that person or the different community member is approaching me um, and to just think from their point of view really helped uh, make this a good experience. Thank Great you. <laughs> right. And um, this um, also is my question, but also it came from the audience. Um, what is your favorite restaurants in Koreatown and favorite shops? Ah, those are always hard, but um, one restaurant I, that comes to my mind um, that really touches on my childhood in Korea is that um, a lot of people think like Korean food is like Korean barbecue and it is, but um, Korea has like a big seafood um, genre. Uh, seafood is in almost everything. And I really love like raw seafood. And as a child, I would eat the um, the raw octopus. And mm -hmm. I don't think many children eat that when they're younger, but I, I did and I really liked it. And for the longest time, I thought it was something you could only get in Korea. And there's quite a few um, Korean seafood restaurants that that serve it and do it well on top of like live lobster so i would say right now favorite korean restaurant might be i think it's Hwaro Gwangjang. It's oh, yes. of, um, western and they have like the korean style um raw 
raw fish is, is really an experience. So I would say that. And if anybody hasn't tried it, they should try it. Yes, yes. And then um, shop wise, yeah. And then shop wise, <laughs> grocery shopping is my favorite Korean town shop just because it has everything. Um, and I, I tend to go to the gallery on Vermont and Fifth. Um, so <laughs> grocery store is my favorite shop. Yeah, and oftentimes the grocery store, the, the building the grocery store is are in has many shops on the, like the other floor. So you once you're done with your grocery store uh, shopping, then you can go to other shops and get like you can get your clothes or you can get like hair pins and um, Korean music CDs and so um, yeah, it's like a multi level shopping experience in Koreatown. Definitely. And that's what we did um, as a family. We would, you know, beeline to the grocery store and then me and my sister and brother would split to go to like Art Box and look at all the latest CDs and uh, stationery. And like my dad would find a cafe to read his newspaper and my mom would be doing all the groceries. So right. I agree. <laughs> right. Definitely. Yeah. That, that was my experience too. Like different family members doing different things in one building. Right. Um, Suji Fu also asks, um, do you speak, read Korean? I notice often the best Korean restaurants signs are um, often in Korean language. And there was a noodle shop my friend took me to years ago, but I never knew name. So um, I do um, speak Korean. <laughs> Reading, um, it used to be better, but I don't think so. I mean, I still can read the signs. Um, so it does really help. and to kind of speak Korean to the servers and waitresses does help. But I do find it um, funny that a lot of the times my parents won't remember the restaurant name. They would just remember, remember the sign, it's like red or has like a dumpling on it. It was next to this plaza. Mm. Um, so, and it kind of ties in with like my map because you know it's not always like the street street names or addresses like oh it was next to the grocery store or you know two blocks over there was the uh, like random like chicken barbecue shop or something so um yeah yeah um maybe that's a good segue to move on to our next um next part where i just wanted to bring out some of the archival photos in our um library but um um i wanted to show this photo um, in our photo collection where uh, it's a photo of Olympic Plaza, uh, which uh, was located at 20, 2727 Olympic Boulevard in Koreatown. Um, photographer Dean Musgrove and it's from the Herald Examiner collection. And um, when you know the exact location, um, even though you don't remember the building name or the um, or the exact business names, you can locate it and um, you can find how it looks like in current days. <laughs> so now the uh, the building name changed, but like the similar signages are there and um, um, it's from the different direction, but how um, things changed, but kind of similar <laughs> still. And then, um, the Korean shopping center um, market, which was at um, 8th Street and Normandy Avenue. And now it looks like this. So um, I wanted to reiterate one more time that like knowing the exact location um, and it really, really helps people who are living in the later years um, to learn about what has happened and what kind of changes were made. So um, I wanted to say that I really appreciate that um, you were able to link maps and um, the signages and illustrative work in case for people who are like me, who don't remember the, um, the location, but like, uh, oh yeah, that, that part, that corner. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, Mickey. Um, we have prepared a short activity for you, um, for the audience. Um, I have prepared this um, art kit box um, from provided by the Broad Museum. But inside of the box, there are some art supplies and um, 
uh, coloring pages, which I print, uh, printed and colored. And also um, this one, I thought it might be a great example where you could um, do a work like this on your own. But um, you could, um, if you had a chance to pick up one of these boxes, you can take a look at them. And also the coloring pages are available on our online calendar at lapl.org. Um, maybe the link will be pop up there. So that's one part of it. And um, I also asked Miki to kind of show us how she created the map um, uh, project and how you can start your own um, mapping um, of your own neighborhoods and uh, community. Yeah, so um, the easy, well, okay, so if you want to do like a literal map, the easiest way is just take like a, a screenshot of like Google Maps and what you want to, to map out. But also, um, I think um, just like just for fun, it's, it's kind of more geared towards um, kids, but you can, you know, map out like your own house or just like, just like a few feet around your neighborhood. Um, and I don't have a step by step, but I have an example. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and it's um, it's just something silly I made uh, for my nieces. But the main thing is have a starting point, have your destination and the outer perim perimeter, and then just like adding the details, like how you would describe it to a friend, how to get to like your place or your favorite restaurant. Um, and you can make something <laughs> like this. Like I just made a, from my memory, my um, my sister's house for my my nieces. Their nicknames are Bacon and Meatball. But um, yeah, just on a sheet of paper, draw something like this and fold it up. Um, and this is like a little tidbit I found on a lot of. Uh, transit maps or like local guide maps it's like take a big sheet of paper and you accordion fold it and then glue one part to a, a thicker page and it becomes a, a tr uh, not a treasure map but <laughs> a portable map that you could carry so it's just something <laughs> fun you can do yeah um from um from the uh, box that I prepared, there were um, several things in it. Um, there were um, like a little notebook where you can make a memo or um, document like things changing in your neighborhood. Like for example, like I see like historic building um, taken down and then like a new kind of a ugly develop new development building coming up. So <laughs> you can take a note on that or like jot down the details um and yeah so thank you mickey uh so much and um there are a lot of shout outs from the audience um uh love the map uh stories storage shelves said love the map and um glory song um empathize with you that the rock fish uh, cold noodles are the best and um yeah <laughs> Thank you, um, Song. <laughs> thank you. And yeah. I, um, I did want to mention that, like, I'm really thankful for um, LA Public Library and all the resources um, and programs that you guys have. It's um, it's really, really resourceful. And I, I'm planning to check out more of the special collections because you guys have a lot of good, um, uh, not only like records and archives, but um, collections of maps of uh, old Los Angeles. So I want to shout out you guys <laughs> and all the good things that you guys have there. Yes, uh, thank you so much. We um, we enjoy uh, working with community members and we are gonna try uh, work harder to really document um, community archives uh, activities um, such as yours. And the one um, update is that we are working on possibly archiving websites of restaurants that have closed during the COVID-19 pandemic, such as Coney Pizzeria and uh, several other restaurants in Koreatown. So, um, and well, not only Koreatown, but all over LA County. So we are, um, we are 
being more active, um, searching for things that we need to preserve uh, for people just like us. Um, and um, lastly, um, please uh, visit Mickey's uh, website. I think the link will pop up here. And then Mickey also has two Instagram handles, um, one Koreatown Times and one uh, Nicholas. Um, so yeah, check them out. And if you have any questions um, uh, to the uh, digitization special collections department, um, if you have any questions regarding the archival photos or any collections, um, please email at rarebook at lapl.org. Thank you so much, everybody. And thank you, Mickey, for um, let us be inspired by your work. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.